To start off at the very beginning, we need to understand that photons and electrons are both waves and particles. The experiment proved that electrons act as particles when they are being watched, but act like waves when they are not. And the photoelectric effect was used to prove that light can act as a particle. To put it as simple as possible, quantum electrodynamics is about the forces between particles, and you use it all day every day. When you put your hand on the computer or phone, the electrons in your hand repel the electrons in the computer keys or the phone screen. So what happens is, is that you never actually touch the atoms of the device. The force between the electrons is due to some quantum electrodynamics. You might say it's just to do with the charges, but that is what quantum electrodynamics is. When the electrons get near each other, how do they know that each other is there? How do they send a message to each other? The idea of quantum electrodynamics is that they send a virtual photon to each other. But what is a virtual photon? This makes no sense. It makes no sense because they're not real. That is what virtual means. They are a mathematical creation so that the mathematical equations can be satisfied. In fact, they often break the laws of physics. They can go faster than light, they can travel back in time, and they even don't conserve energy. The only reason that they work is that they more or less cancel each other out in equations. So the answer that we get is only fractally out from the actual answer. Which means that we have to actually call it an approximation. The reason that it is all okay is that this is quantum physics. Heisenberg said that what is actually or really happening inside a subatomic process is not directly observable and so we can't model it on a computer without the use of virtual particles. There was a man named Richard Philip Feynman and he summed up quantum electrodynamics or QED in three simple statements. A photon goes from one place in time to another place in time. An electron goes from one place in time to another place in time. An electron emits or absorbs a photon at a certain place and time. These three statements can be represented on a diagram. The way that a Feynman diagram works is that time is always going up then we have particles coming in at the bottom and going out at the top, then whatever is happening in the middle. So if we plot space along the x-axis and time along the y-axis, then draw them on. A photon goes from one place in time to another place in time. So we can start off at here, in this point in space and time. Then we can draw it to move to this point in space and time. The next one is an electron can go from one place in time to another place in time. So this is the same thing. Lastly, an electron can emit or absorb a photon at a certain place in time. To draw this, we need an electron to collide with a photon. The electron starts at a point in space and time, and a photon starts in another point in space and time. As they move together, provided that the photon is the right energy level, the electron will absorb it, and then it will change the path of the electron. Now, it's important not to take these diagrams too literally. Nothing is implied about what is making the particles move. It could be a chemical reaction, or it could be in a wire with current running through it, or it could be flying away from the Big Bang. It also doesn't imply anything about the speeds that they move at, or that a photon is any more wave-like than an electron. The main idea of quantum electrodynamics is about the forces that two particles feel when they have a charge, whether that be a like charge or an opposite charge. So what happens is that the two electrons move together, then they will suddenly repel each other as they are both negative. For this, there must be communication between the two electrons, and this happens via a virtual photon, sometimes called a force carrier. Now this photon can represent either a pull or a push. Another concept that we need to understand is that we can have pair creation or pair annihilation. This is when matter and antimatter come together and annihilate each other so that there is nothing left but energy, or the other way around so energy will form matter and antimatter. So I need to add a little brief explanation on subatomic particles and antimatter. Subatomic particles are split into three main sections, quarks, leptons, which are both fermions, and bosons. With this lesson, we are not really bothered about quarks, but leptons and bosons are going to make up a big part of it. Leptons are the following, electrons, muons, tau, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. They are all the same family, and all the neutrinos have no charge, and the electrons, muons, and taus all have negative charge. Bosons are the following, photons, gluons, Z boson, and plus and minus W boson. There is also the singular scalar Higgs boson. Now, antimatter is basically the opposite of matter. 
It is the same, but everything has the opposite charge. So for example, an electron and a positron. They have the same mass, but different charges. We need to know this because it is going to help us describe what happens when a proton becomes a neutron. What happens is that the proton will turn into a neutron, a positron, which is the antimatter version of an electron, and a neutrino. So what you might think is that the proton comes in and then splits into three particles. But what really happens is that the proton will come in and split into a neutron and a W plus boson comes out, which then quickly decays into a positron and a neutrino. This is that energy creating matter right here. But interestingly, this can go the other way around. A neutron comes in, then splits into a proton and a W minus boson, which will then decay into an electron and an antineutrino. What this actually means, in the crudest sense, is that anything that can happen, will happen if there is three conditions. The total number of protons, neutrons is conserved, so if we lose a proton, we will gain a neutron. The total number of leptons are conserved, so if we lose an electron, we gain a neutrino. And the total charge is conserved. I said earlier that an electron will absorb a photon providing that it has the right energy levels, and these energy levels are discrete. This means that they have fixed values. If the energy is slightly too high or slightly too low, then nothing will actually happen. The way it works is that the electron is bound to an atom. They ideally want to be as close to the atom as possible. This is called the ground state. For it to move to the next state, it needs to gain energy. It will do this by absorbing a photon. If the electron wants to move down a state, it will emit a photon so that it loses energy. Then it can move down. So quantum electrodynamics is all about the interactions between particles on the quantum level and what happens when particles become other particles like a proton into a neutron. This also leads into the cool area of emission and absorption spectrums. Starting with absorption, when white light passes through a cool gas, certain frequencies of light will be at the right energy levels to be absorbed and so are removed. This is the way that we can tell what elements and molecules a gas cloud is made of in space. Then the emission spectrum works the other way around. It comes from a hot gas and then it will release the certain frequencies and then you will get a spectrum that has very slim lines of colour. There is actually history behind it all. QED can actually stand for two things. Quad erat demonstratium or quantum electrodynamics. Quad erat demonstratium means which had to be demonstrated and this means something had to be proved which works really well with electrodynamics because electrodynamics proved a lot, in fact more than anything else. To a physicist though, QED does stand for quantum electrodynamics, which was described as the jewel of physics by Richard Feynman. QED is also important that it's the only theory that can link quantum behaviour of subatomic particles to a relativistic scale such as stars, galaxies and black holes. It all started with Paul Dirac in the 1920s and he was the first to put together an equation that connected energy and matter and showed how they would interact to produce light and other electromagnetic radiation such as ultraviolet and infrared. But in 1940 physicists ran into some issues with infinity which means all the calculations became meaningless and they nearly abandoned the theory until a man named Hans Bess came along. In 1947 he was travelling from New York and developed a procedure called renormalization which basically takes the infinity out of the equation. However, Feynman didn't like this idea of renormalization, saying that it was a dippy process. Using Beth's intuition and papers from a group of scientists called Sin and Trino Tomonaga, Julian Schwinger, Richard Feynman, then Freeman Dyson allowed quantum electrodynamics to be computed without error. Then Richard Feynman created a mathematical technique using his diagrams, which turned out to be the same as the complex mathematics that others had created. Now physicists were able to calculate to a high degree of accuracy some of the properties of an electron. However, as Feynman pointed out, the theory does not explain why particles have particular masses that they do. He even said that there is no theory to adequately explain these numbers. We just use the numbers in our theory and we don't really understand them. So there is a lot more work to be done on the subject.